Today we are going to be talking about uh, MHC function um, and specifically both today and Monday we are kind of zooming in on the details of how we go from having um, a protein from a pathogen in the cell to how it gets degraded, uh, put on the MHC molecule, and then presented to a T cell. Um, in order to uh, kind of generally think about these issues, I do want to remind you of a few general cell biology issues. Um, the first of which is just sort of that I want to generally remind you of the biosynthetic secretory pathway, sometimes known as the endocytic pathway. There's a bunch of names for it. I don't know which name you know for it. I'm going to call it biosynthetic secretory right now, but whatever. Um, and what you can notice on this picture of the cell is that the cell is uh, divided into some regions that are different colors. So that you can see that the nucleus is one color. And in fact, the nucleus is like its own special compartment that we're not really dealing with at any point. But you can also see that the rest of the cell, or rest of everything we can see here, is sort of divided into this like lightish blue and this yellow color. The lightish blue is the cytoplasm. The yellow is the outside of the cell, um, all of which is across a membrane from the cytoplasm. But also, we see yellow depicting the insides of different compartments in the cell including the ER, the Golgi, um, the lysosome, and lots of other vesicles. All of those vesicles are really connected to one another through this pathway of transport. So, what we'll, so the way that things work from the ER is that you have vesicles that bud off the ER, they eventually fuse with the Golgi, they might go to the plasma membrane, they might go to the lysosome, if things are coming in in vesicles, you can also see them coming into the lysosome. And so in some ways, you can think of all of the areas that are shown here in yellow as being connected to one another. Um, you can see that something that was outside of the cell can be endocytosed, and it will end up in a vesicle. You can see that something that is going to be secreted um, will be in a vesicle before it gets secreted. So there is this connection with the outside of the cell. Um, and you can also think about it as the yellow areas are all across a plasma membrane, across a lipid bilayer from the cytoplasm. In a lot of aspects of cell biology, um, moving things across a membrane, moving things across a lipid bilayer is a very energy dependent process. And so one of the things that's going to be really important to us is in any place where we want to have something move from blue to yellow, there is going to have to be an energetic cost. And so typically the cell tries to either do a whole bunch of stuff in blue and only have one move to yellow or do a move to yellow early and stay in yellow because it doesn't want to have the energy to push things across membranes multiple times. Um, just as a sort of general reminder of kind of how this works, you can see this connection here. Um, proteins are translated on uh, ribosomes. Those ribosomes can be um, in the cytoplasm. They can make proteins that are in the cytoplasm. The end. Or the ribosome can actually go to the ER and translate that protein and push it across the ER membrane at the same time. It actually takes advantage of the energy of translation to get a nice shove on that protein and push it across the ER membrane. Um, and so you can see that um, if a protein is going to be a transmembrane protein or if it's going to go anywhere in this secretory pathway, it had to be uh, translated at the rough ER and is translated by a ribosome that's actually at the ER membrane. Um, and so that's a big place where this distinction occurs. So we get things from the cytosol into the ER. Once proteins are in the ER, they can sort of move within all of these other areas that are uh, connected by green arrows through this vesicular transport pathway. 
they've already done the energy intensive process of crossing a membrane and now they can sort of move within that pathway. When this process happens, there are a couple of details of topology that you need to be aware of that are going to be sort of important as we are talking about stuff today. This is really showing you the same thing in two different pictures. So if we look at this compartment that's shown on the uh, left hand side, this compartment could be the ER that's eventually going to have send something to the Golgi. It could be the Golgi sending it somewhere else. You can call them whatever you want. <laughs> what you can see is that there are two layers of lipids, the outside layer and the inside layer. It's a phospholipid bilayer, so there's two. And they are shown here in two different colors. One of them's blue and one of them's green. You can see that the pink stuff, which is inside the um, compartment, is the pink stuff inside the compartment. And you can see that we've got some transmembrane proteins. Um, you can see that the pointy part is towards the inside of the compartment, and the round part is at the outside of the compartment. What you should notice is as a vesicle buds off and travels, that topology remains the same. So the lipids that were on the outside that were touching the cytoplasm before stay the lipids that were outside touching the cytoplasm. And they're still the lipids that are outside touching the cytoplasm. The lipids that are on the inside are still the ones that are on the inside and they stay on the inside. You can see that the pink dots stay on the inside. They stay away from the cytoplasm all the time. You can see that the orientation of these proteins stays the same. So the part that was by the cytoplasm, the round part, always stays by the cytoplasm. The part that was inside always stays inside. And that continues until we get to the target compartment when, where this vesicle fuses. You can see that the pink cargo is still inside the vesicles. It never like went out to the cytoplasm and went back in. It stayed inside through this whole time. It stayed close to the green lipids, which were the inside lipids. It stayed far from the blue lipids, the outside lipids. Again, the round part is outside. <laughs> the straight part is inside. Um, and so that topology is maintained as things move through this pathway. You can see the exact same thing um, in this other figure um, on the uh, right hand side. Um, this topology is also critical when we are at the cell membrane. Um, so we can have materials in say the Golgi that go into a vesicle that eventually get um, fuse with the plasma membrane. We can have cargo like the blue rectangles. You'll see that as we make a vesicle, the cargo stays inside the vesicle. It's away from the cytoplasm. Then when that vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, the cargo is secreted from the cell. It is in fact still away from the cytoplasm. Um, you can also see that um, the part of this protein that's by the cytoplasm stays by the cytoplasm in the vesicle and stays by the cytoplasm when we get to the plasma membrane. So this part that was inside the Golgi, inside the ER, is eventually going to be the extracellular part of that transmembrane protein, which could say be the receptor part. Um, and so if we want to put a receptor to bind to something important in a cell, we need to have it on this side of this membrane from the beginning of the process. Um, and in fact, you can see that same thing happening um, with endocytosis. So here I'm showing you with exocytosis. But if I was going to phagocytose or envelop something, again, the stuff that's away from the cytoplasm would always stay away from the cytoplasm in the vesicles, um, the same kind of topology issues would hold there. Um, you are going to see these topology issues come up today as we talk about the MHC class 1 processing pathway. And you're going to see them also show up again when we talk about class 2 on Monday. So I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page with them before I started the processing pathways. Um, so today we're specifically talking about MHC class 1. 
um, and the processing pathway for MHC class one. Um, so here you can see uh, the MHC class one structure. It's got that nice heavy chain um, with three uh, domains, uh, the alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three that come together and make that peptide binding cleft. We have this other protein, beta 2M, that comes in as a partner to help this uh, thing fold. Um, in fact, you are not going to get a stable folded structure until you have um, the heavy chain, beta 2M, and a peptide there. So until you have all of them together, the whole thing will not be a stable structure. It will not stay folded. Um, eventually, that uh, MHC class 1 plus peptide will bind to a T cell receptor as well as CD8 on a T cell in order to allow that T cell to be activated. And all of our nucleated cells are going to be able to do this process that we're talking about today. Um, so the uh, other thing that I told you about um, last time is that I told you that MHC class 1 is presenting peptides from the cytoplasm. Um, this is a figure from your textbook that sort of is an overview of both class one and class two. There is one piece of this figure that I despise. And so when we go through class two, um, you're going to see a modified version of it a lot where I just change the part I don't like. Um, but this is just a general overview for today. In general, um, we can take this process of um, processing and presenting antigen by MHC and divide it up into steps. Um, I've got it divided up here into five steps. I used to do them as six, so if I get confused, one of, I guess now I have a 2A and a 2B because <laughs> as I can condense them. And so we can go through the process of class one today thinking about these five steps and how they work. And then on Monday, we'll just, it'll be the same five steps, and we'll kind of see how each of the same problems are solved. Um, so the first step is called acquisition. Um, the next step, I think, is called proteolysis, is what I settled on. Then we've got um, delivery. binding, and display. So we're going to think about how each of these happen. I will also tell you that for both class one and class two, there's one step that's like super important in each of them. It's not the same step in both cases. And in some of these, you're go we're going to look at the step and you're going to be like, that is the dumbest thing ever that she made that a step. Why did she make that a step? And the answer is because if it's like not that interesting in class one, it is interesting in class two. So it's, it's just really, a th so that's why. <laughs> so if you look at something and you're like, that shouldn't get its own step, it's because it's interesting in the other one. Um, and so we're going to see one of these steps that's really the big problem um, in class one presentation. Um, so if we start out thinking about acquisition of the antigen, how do we acquire the antigen for class one presentation? Based on what we've talked about so far for class one, what might you imagine for the acquisition? Yep. Yeah. So, in, so the cell doesn't really have to do anything to acquire the antigen. It just is unlucky and gets infected. <laughs> um, and so for acquisition, um, right now we'll say infection for class one. Um, so this one's, you know, not that big a deal. The cell gets infected. There's some virus, for example, or some microbe making proteins in the cytoplasm. Good, we're done. Um, then we can move on to thinking about how that antigen, how that protein gets degraded. It turns out there are two different trash pathways in your cell. One of them is the trash pathway for the cytoplasm. The other one is the trash pathway for the secretory pathway. It's again the which side of the membrane are you on? <laughs> um, and it turns out Proteolysis is the cytoplasm's trash pathway. It's 
the one that we usually think of. Um, this has a couple different parts. Um, so the first thing that happens is something that is called ubiquitination. Sometimes people call this process ubiquitillation. Those two words mean the same thing. Um, the idea is that there is this small protein. It is called ubiquitin. Here is a picture of ubiquitin. It is a protein. It's 76 amino acids, um, 8.5 uh, KD, and it gets stuck on stuff. Think of it as like a little sticker that gets stuck on things. And so what happens first for our proteolysis is that we stick ubiquitin on the protein. Um, and so our target protein gets a ubiquitin added to some lysine um, in that protein. So the amino, uh, the amino group on the lysine gets ubiquitins added. Very frequently, you will see a string of four ubiquitins added together. Um, ubiquitin addition can actually happen in a few different ways. Um, in terms of, is it a linear chain of four? Is it branch chains? Is it one? Is it three? Is it four? Um, they actually end up leading to different cell biology outcomes. But four in a line means trash. <laughs> four in a line means degrade this. Um, and so we have this set of enzymes that sticks ubiquitins on the proteins. This is a general part of cell biology. All of the proteins in your cell have a specific half-life. They are all made at some rate, and they're all degraded at some rate. Sometimes it's because they are um, they're defective in some way, they're misfolded in some way. Sometimes it's kind of just like the iPhone. Like, you just get a new one because your other one's old. And so there is sort of this general background turnover rate of proteins in the cell. And the way that they are um, marked to say, destroy this one, um, if they are cytoplasmic, is that they get ubiquitin added to them. When a protein has a linear chain of four ubiquitins, it goes to the trash organelle of the cytoplasm. That trash organelle is called the proteasome. It's an organelle, so it has ohm. But it's an ohm made of proteases. So it's the protease ohm, or the proteasome. <laughs> um, and so anything that's labeled with ubiquitin will get put into this organelle called the proteasome and will get degraded and made into peptides. Um, and so proteolysis for class one is uh, ubiquitin tagging and then the proteasome. Um, there are some fun things I can tell you about the proteasome. Um, so the proteasome um, structurally really looks like this. Um, so it has um, two identical caps on either end, as well as um, this core structure, which actually does the proteolytic activity. That core structure is made of four rings, which you can see here. And if you cut through the rings, you can basically see this chamber that's inside where we have a lot of active protease activity. It's good that we keep it inside the middle of a chamber so we don't destroy the whole cell. Um, and this is where the proteins can be um, uh, degraded. And so what we will see happening is um, the cap will bind to ubiquitin and start unfolding the protein and threading it into the active site of the protease, uh, the central cylinder where we're actually gonna break down the proteins. And eventually we're gonna have peptides coming out. Um, there's gonna be a range of sizes. It can go all the way down to a two amino acid size peptide that can come out here. Um, and the ubiquitins get taken off so they can get recycled and added to other proteins that need to be destroyed. Um, and then we have peptides that can be used for kind of general cell metabolism. Um, one other thing to note 
is that the um, part that actually does the um, cleavage, that cylinder is made up of these four rings and they each have, I believe it's seven subunits making up the ring. The reason why that matters is that sometimes when cells are undergoing an immune response, when those cells have received cytokines, they can actually make some new subunits for the proteasome. So they can get rid of the normal proteasome. They can actually switch out a few of the subunits. They're the ones that are shown over here uh, in the brighter colors, like the brighter green and the brighter yellow and the brighter red. Those are induced subunits, so we get rid of the other ones, we put these in, and we make this new specialized proteasome. Um, this new specialized proteasome is called the immunoproteasome, and it makes peptides that are super good for class one. So if there's an immune response going on, if there are certain types of cytokines, that's actually usually uh, class two interferon, um, then the proteasome switches up and gets better at making peptides. Um, that will bind to class one. So um, it's a sort of nice system here. Um, so at this point, we've acquired some antigen. We've degraded that antigen. But we're going to have a problem. Yep? Why not just always um, Because, so. A, it's a little bit more of an energetic cost to get those uh, things cleaved. And one of the things is it keeps them more like in the 8 to 10 range instead of going down to something like 2, which in those small ones might be more useful for other things. It's going to be harder to reuse the, the bigger ones. Um, so that's going to be the biggest issue. Um, so at this point, we got this is where we are. Um, and we've talked about the antigen. A bit here. But what we haven't talked about is the MHC class 1 molecule itself. And the whole point of this story is to tell you how the MHC class 1 molecule gets its antigen. So here's, here's the proteasome. It's making some peptides. Yay. Um, MHC class 1 is a transmembrane protein. We want to present it on the surface of the cell. We want to present the peptide in the peptide binding cleft on the outside of the cell so that a T cell can see it. Thus, it makes it really important how it is in the ER in the first place because we have to make sure that topology is right. You wouldn't really, it would be really bad if it showed the peptide to the inside of the cell instead of to the outside of the cell where the T cell could see it. And so to make this whole process work, um, the uh, MHC class 1 molecule, as well as beta 2M, which is this little comma thing, um, are biosynthesized in the ER um, on rough ER ribosomes, just like every other transmembrane protein. Um, but they cannot um, fold into a correctly folded stable structure until they have peptide. And they don't have peptide yet, so they're sad. Fortunately, we have a bunch of chaperones that hold them in place, ready for the peptide. Um, and so we've got this MHC class 1 molecule, has nothing in its peptide binding groove, and it's being held in place by a bunch of chaperones. One of those chaperones that we're going to care about in particular later is the one that's pink here called tapasin, but we'll get to tapasin. Um, and if you look at this figure, we can also see the big problem in MHC class 1 presentation. So if you look at this figure and you think about this process that we want to do, what is the problem that you can imagine? There's the MHC. It's like, hello, I'm ready for my peptide. <laughs> yeah, Nick. <laughs> yeah, the, the peptides are in the cytosol, are floating around in the cytosol, hanging out in the cytosol. 
and the open cleft of the MHC is on the inside of the ER. So how the heck do we get these peptides over to there? <laughs> And that problem is a problem of delivering the peptides, the delivery problem, and it was really the big problem that people had to understand in order to understand how MHC class one presentation works. Yep? Why wouldn't it just, like, why wouldn't that peptide just be tagged with, like, one of those signaling proteins that, like, sends those changes to the ER? Um, so those signaling proteins that send it to the ER, are part of the amino acid sequence. So those are, that's a sorting signal. Um, and so if it's a virus peptide, why the heck would the virus evolve to have a sorting signal to make it easier for the immune system? <laughs> um, so instead, we have a way to solve this delivery problem. There are two special proteins that are known as TAP1 and TAP2. Um, TAP stands for the transporter for antigen processing. And TAP1 and TAP2 are the key proteins that really kind of allow this whole thing to work. Um, so TAP1 and TAP2 are, a, are transporters um, across the ER membrane. They actually require ATP, and they specifically shoot peptides from the cytoplasm into the ER. And so we have this nice transporter system where we move lots of peptides straight into the ER. Yep. They take all peptides. We'll get there. They take all peptides. All peptides of the correct length. Yes. That is going to be super important. So all peptides of the correct length, even though if it's confusing now and you're making a face at me. It's important later. <laughs> um, so the next part of this is binding. The ER is a pretty big place. Happily, tapicin, the chaperone I told you before, binds to tap and binds to the MHC and holds them next to each other so that as the peptides kind of get shot into the ER, they can land right in the open peptide binding cleft that is next to it. <laughs> and so the fact, and so it, the binding is honestly pretty much just automatic or constitutive at this point. As soon as the peptides get thrown into the right place, they automatically bind. So we can kind of say that binding is because of tapicin holding everything in place. It's not maybe as key of a step, but that's okay because binding is going to be a fun step for class two. Um, so we've got uh, those peptides bound. Um, sometimes we will have some proteases in the ER that will trim the peptides a little bit to make them exactly the right length for the peptide binding cleft. Um, but any peptide that has the appropriate um, anchor residues will just bind to the MHC class one molecule um, that it finds. Once we have finished this binding process, then we can move on to the final step, which is display. And display is actually pretty easy in the case of class one as well. Um, once this uh, whole stable structure um, is put together, the general baseline cell biology processes send it to the, the membrane of the cell. So it's actually a constitutive process once the, the fully formed structure is made. So display takes zero effort. It's a constitutive process. So that's kind of the basics of class one. Um, though there are a few sort of little details that I want to uh, sort of highlight for you. Um, so of course, once this cell is presenting this antigen on, this, on its surface, that will um, potentially lead to a CD8 T cell responding to um, that MHC plus peptide that's on the surface of this antigen presenting cell 
that CD8 positive T cell is a cytotoxic T cell and can kill this cell that is presenting. Um, and so this is sort of going to be the, the end of the process. This is actually the other reason why I decided I didn't want to do a paper here, because it's really hard to find a paper about antigen presentation that doesn't also go into a lot of T cell biology. Um, and so it didn't make sense to have a confusing paper here. Um, and so this is our general overview of the class one presentation pathway. You can see the figure from your book um, where you can see all of these steps happening for class one. You can also see um, this table that tells us about the polymorphic alpha chain, beta two microglobulin happening in all nucleated cells, CDH recognized. We're looking at cytosolic proteins. We do degradation with the proteasome. Loading happens in the ER, and then we've got chaperones and TAP that are super important. So that's all great. Um, but there are a couple, like I said, tricks to this that I do want to make sure are really clear. Um, so when I was putting this together, I know I'd seen this before, but I, I came across this again last night. There's this review that's called something like Present Yourself, um, and it has some interesting figures. And so you're going to see a few figures from this review as I am talking. And this is the first one of them. Um, and so here you can see um, our antigen or our protein. You can see that it gets cut up in the proteasome um, to the point where we have a piece of some peptide that gets shuttled into the ER across TAP. Tapicin, uh, MHC is ready to, bind, ready to get it, ready to receive it. Tapicin helps that process happen. And then eventually, it goes straight to the surface to show this to a cytotoxic T lymphocyte. So this is sort of a simplified view of this. But if we're a little more realistic about our view, the thing that is happening actually looks a little bit more like this. So remember that every cell, if we're in the case of a human, has two HLA-As, one from mom, one from dad, two HLA-Bs, one from mom, one from dad, two HLA-Cs, one from mom, one from dad. And they each have slightly different peptide binding clefts. They could bind to slightly different peptides. When our antigen, when our protein is actually cleaved, it isn't cleaved into one kind of peptide. It's cleaved into a whole bunch of kinds of peptides that are bunches of different parts of that protein. And some of them might bind to various um, HLA molecules on the surface of that cell. And so our cell doesn't just have one MHC molecule and one peptide on its surface. It has a whole bunch. And it might even have multiple of this A's with the pink thing. <laughs> Dunaway is <laughs> loving it. <laughs> Um, and so this brings up an important concept um, called immunodominance um, that is often seen with uh, epitopes that uh, lead to T cell simulation. So I'm going to talk about it in a couple different ways. Hopefully, that one, at least one of them will make sense to you. Um, so when we have um, some protein that is um, degraded, it usually contains multiple epitopes, not just one. Here you can see there's a brown one and a blue one and a purple one. They will all become peptides in that cell. And, you, and for some reason, when we actually look at the T cells in the end, it turns out that we don't usually get an equal number of T cells to each uh, antigen. One seems to be more dominant than the others. Um, just to give you another example, if we look at people who have one particular type of MHC called HLA-A2, these are some of the peptides that can be made um, from HIV in a person who is HLA-A2 positive. So, these are, and I actually know of some other ones that can be presented by this one. So you don't have one epitope from HIV in this person getting presented. You have all of these that could possibly be presented. Some of them are from the protein called GAG, some are from ONV, some are from NEF. These are all different proteins. And what you can see is you don't get equivalent amounts of protein 
uh, of T cells to each of these epitopes. Um, you can see that some of them seem to be more dominant, while others seem to be less dominant. One thing that you can also notice is here you can see two of them, LV10 and PL10, that are both from NEF. So it's not even about which protein they're from, necessarily. Um, and to be perfectly honest, we know some of the things that lead to immunodominance, but not all of them. And so um, what actually ends up being the peptide epitope that is presented in the case of any particular infection will depend on things like what peptides get made. Um, so it turns out that if you actually like do the math of certain pox viruses, you could make 175,000 different peptides that are of 8 to 10 amino acids long. But when you actually look at which ones get made by the proteasome, only 35,000 do. So the proteasome seems to have some specificity, like some residues it likes to cleave after. Again, we don't totally understand all of that process. Um, most of those can be transported by TAP, though not all of them. But then only a very small, of that, small number can bind to any particular class 1 molecule. Um, and even of those, only some of them are going to lead to a good T cell response. Um, so you should realize that there are multiple epitopes um, that can be made from any one microbe um, and presented on class 1. Um, and they are going to vary in their effectiveness of the T cell response. Um, and again, there are parts of that that we, there are parts of that that have to do with the T cell side, and there are parts of that we don't totally understand uh, why that is. Yeah? Why are there parts that we don't understand? Like, wouldn't it make sense that for different, like, peptide sequences, you would have different levels of binding? The, that is most likely what is going on in terms of affinity, um, but it's really hard to measure affinity in vivo. And so this, like, um, there was actually a paper that came out, like, last week that sort of, like, really hinted at that and did probably the best measurements we've seen of such things, but it's not an easy measurement to make. That is a, a big, that is one of the two things that is assumed to be part of it. It's been hypothesized. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Uh, it has to do with cytokine receptor levels. All right, so we saw this figure a second ago. Um, and we saw that there are, in reality, multiple peptides made from any one protein in our cell getting presented on multiple different MHC molecules. And what I really want you to remember from this slide right now is that our cell doesn't have one MHC molecule on its surface. It has a whole bunch. And it shows here that it has one of each of these six. It probably, it, it could have a hundred of this pink one. Like, it's going to have multiple copies of some of these. So there's going to be lots of MHCs with lots of clefts on the surface of that cell. So if you look at this image, it shows that there is one protein in the cell getting degraded. Is there really, how many proteins are actually in a cell? A lot. A lot. Not, not just one chicken. <laughs> um, what, so what other kinds of proteins might there be? So there's all of the pathogen proteins, but there's also all of the self proteins. And the proteasome is a normal way that cellular proteins are degraded. So self peptides are being made 24-7 in your cells, going through the proteasome. There are always self-peptides being made, just like there are always, well, there are pathogen peptides being made if there's a pathogen. If there's no pathogen, you still make self-peptides. The proteasome doesn't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. It just chews up proteins. <laughs> TAP doesn't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. It just takes whatever protein gets shot it has and shoots it. MHC doesn't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. It just takes whichever one has the anchor residues and binds to it. And so in reality, 
these figures are more like what a cell presenting on class one will look like. That cell will generally have multiple class one molecules on its surface and they might contain different epitopes. And in fact, some of them will be from a microbe and some of them will be self peptides. It really bothers me that this one is empty. There are none of them are empty. They either have a microbe or a self. Like it really bothers me. <laughs> that one's empty. It can't fold right if it's empty and it can't make it to the surface. <laughs> Here, here it's harder to see, but there's two that are red, which are from the um, antigen, and one that's green, which is from the self protein. And so the idea is that every cell all the time is presenting on MHC class one. Um, it's self peptides. Um, and if it happens to have pathogen peptides, it's going to present those pathogen peptides as well. And this presentation of self peptides is a critical part of the homeostasis. Um, that is needed for a lot of different cell types or a lot of different parts of the body. We'll get to that in a second. So every single one of your cells, except for red blood cells, is presenting on MHC class one right now. Um, self peptides or pathogen peptides if you happen to have some pathogens. Um, so you know, the cell doesn't try to decide is this a good peptide or a bad peptide. It just shows it to the T cell and lets the T cell make the decision. So basically all the peptides are getting presented and then it's sort of up to the T cell if that T cell, if that peptide is a problem or not. So that's why sometimes with Dr. Miller, she always says it's like a, a, a mommy, mommy, look what I caught. And it's not just things you caught, it's also just things you have. And maybe like that is actually the psychology of a four year old who's like, mommy, mommy, look what I already own. But <laughs> it, it, you're showing everything, not just the thing you just recently caught. You're actually showing off pieces of every single protein you have. It's kind of like the cells like, am I good? This is what's in me, am I good? <laughs> is kind of what's going on with these cells. Um, so with all parts of the immune system, there are really critical um, places where we can see interesting evolution between the immune system and between pathogens. And class one is a super awesome example of this. And so we have found tons of viruses that have figured out ways to trick MHC class one path pathways. And so there are tons of viruses that have ways to evade immune responses in general but class one is actually like the star place where we've seen evasion. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some examples. The point here is not that I'm ever going to make you like memorize all the examples. I want to show you some of the ways this happens. So first of all, um, there's a protein that's called, or there's a virus called Epstein-Barr virus. It's a causative agent of mono as well as of Birkin's lymphoma. Um, Epstein-Barr virus um, has a protein called EBNA1. EBNA1 is actually the, the um, protein that is made at the highest level in this virus. So like there's way more of it in terms of grams than of all the other proteins. Um, and so you could imagine that EBNA1 is prob would theory theoretically be presented all the time because there's so much of it. EBNA1 has these weird glycine alanine repeats. And what we have realized is that they can't be caught up by the proteasome. And so EBNA1 actually gunks up the proteasome and doesn't get proteolized by the proteasome. As a result, there are no peptides from EBNA1 made, and they can never go on to MHC class 1. Now, you can imagine there are going to be some other peptides. The self-peptides might still be OK, because they might be in other proteasomes. But EBNA1 is never going to get presented. So that's one way the virus might be able to hide. Um, I will also tell you that every a uh, virus example I'm going to show you right now um, is a large DNA virus. Large DNA viruses are so big that they get to do lots of fun things. The small ones have to do some other, like use other strategies, but the, the big ones, they get to have extra proteins and extra things that let them do all this fun stuff. Um, so the, the two actually most famous um, that are known for viral evasion are HCMV, or human cytomegalovirus, 
um, and HSV or herpes simplex virus. Both of these have proteins that do basically the same thing that look pretty similar structurally. Um, the uh, HSV uh, protein, ICP-47, binds to TAP and plugs it up. If you actually look at the crystal structure, it looks like a stopper. And it just stoppers TAP. Um, HCMV also has a protein that blocks TAP. It blocks it from the other side um, as a transmembrane protein that is in the ER. So I want you to think for a second about what's happening in a cell that is infected with either HSV or HCMV. I'm going to come to your question in a second, but I want, I want to make sure we get through this. So what do you think happens in this cell in terms of MHC class 1 presentation? Yeah. Yeah. These cells have no MHC class 1 on their surface because no peptides make it into the ER. So you never get a finished stable class 1, and you can never send it to the surface of the cell. And so in fact, the self-peptide presentation stops here along with the virus presentation. Yeah, it's a good way for the virus not to get detected, but it has the side effect of messing up self-presentation. Um, these proteins are actually how TAP was discovered. People were trying to figure out what is this virus messing with, and they ended up finding TAP. Um, there is a, another uh, virus, uh, adenovirus, e uh, adenovirus. It has a protein called E19. Um, E19 actually um, binds to the class 1 and moves tapicin away. <laughs> so tapicin is not there to help shepherd peptides into the MHC binding cleft. So at this point, we've had um, a protein that has stopped proteolysis. We've had a virus that has stopped delivery. We've got one that's stopped binding. You're probably not going to stop infection because that would be like against the point of being a virus. Um, but you can see all of the different steps that can be altered. Um, another really fun one is uh, mirin gamma herpes virus, which has a protein called MK3. MK3 actually adds ubiquitins to the MHC class 1 heavy chain, which results in the MHC class 1 heavy chain getting yanked out of the membrane and thrown into the proteasome. Um, so if you look at this one, what do you expect is going to happen with these cells? No display. There is no MHC class 1 on the surface of these cells. Um, and this is sort of a, just one other version of this. There is actually also um, one from a virus called KSHV that pulls class 1 off the actual cell membrane and throws it in, in a different degradation system, the lysosome. And so we can direct that class 1 to get degraded. All of these are awesome ways for the virus to hide. But yes, they do also block self-presentation as well. Yep. Um, they do have the signal sequence so that when they're translated, it will send the ribosome to translate at the ER. The virus has evolved that, yes. Um, and I mentioned to you before that self-peptides are always being presented. Um, this is really, really critical and is actually a big way that part of the immune system has evolved. Oops, that's what I want. There are so many viruses that have evolved ways to mess up MHC class 1. We actually have a type of cell that looks at all the other cells in your body to see whether they have class 1 or not. And if a cell is missing class 1, that means that it's probably got a virus or is in fact messed up in some other way. Perhaps it is stressed as a tumor cell or something like that. So in fact, there, so loss of class 1 from the surface of the cell is such a frequent evasion mechanism, and you can think about how so many of these would cause loss of it, that there is actually a whole separate mechanism of the immune system to monitor cells for whether or not they have class 1 or whether they've lost class 1. The name of that mechanism is natural killer cells, um, which is why I couldn't tell you about natural killer cells before because you didn't know what MEC was, so it didn't really matter. And we're going to talk more about them later. But that's what natural killer cells are really doing is they're looking for um, missing MHC class 1 on cells. Um, so, yeah, Mark. When you said there were big DNA viruses, 
Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they have a large genome? Yes, it means they have both a large genome and a large particle. They are big in any way they could be big. Um, but there's one other major way that we see immune evasion done by a lot of different pathogens. And this example is with a small virus. So it, it doesn't have extra space in its genome. It doesn't have extra space in its particle for fun MHC pulling out proteins. <laughs> so it has an, there's one other really important way that we see evasion. Um, and these data are data from my PhD lab. Um, I'm going to say we, even though it ha this experiment was like a couple years before I got there. But I just know, I like have spent so much time thinking about this experiment that I think about it as, as a we thing. Um, so in this experiment, we were using um, rhesus macaques. We were using monkeys that had a specific MHC class 1 type. Um, in humans, is HLA. Mice is H2. In macaques, it's called mamu for macaca mulata. So they have mamu A1. Um, so they all have mamu A1. We gave them a vaccine to prevent HIV. And um, then we uh, infected them. Um, actually, I think this was just this one's just infection. Now that I look at it, eh, no, this is this is the challenge the challenge one. All right. So anyway, we infect them. They get a lot of virus, but then the virus goes to a low level. It's basically under control. The immune system has that virus under control. You can see at 10 weeks under control, 20 weeks under control. We can look at the CD4 cells. Um, the monkey has OK CD4 cells. It hasn't lost its CD4 cells, especially at weeks you know, 10 and 20. The CD4 cells are not doing too bad. But then all of a sudden, the immune system loses control. You can see that the virus comes back. We crash the CD4 cells. When we went back and looked at the virus, we knew that um, when, you have, when a monkey has MAMU A1, the dominant uh, peptide that gets presented on MAMU A1 is called P11C. Um, it's uh, 11 amino acids, and it starts with, P, with C. So it's CT, CTPYDINQM. You can see it up there. And that's what's responded by the T cell, what the T cells respond to. If you look at the virus over time, you can see that the virus actually mutates and doesn't have that amino acid sequence in it anymore. It mutates so that there's an I instead of a T at this position. That makes this peptide no longer bind to the MHC class 1 molecule. And so now, instead of presenting class 1, having T cells kill the virus and having the immune system win, the immune system can no longer see this virus. The virus is now effectively hiding from the immune system by changing one base pair that changes one amino acid so that the anchor residue is no longer there. And this peptide can no longer bind to its MHC class 1. And so the other big thing that you see um, for avoiding class 1 is you will see mutation of the pathogen so that anchor residues are changed um, and uh, so that um, we no longer see CD8 T cell binding. Yep. Um, because there is um, a huge amount of mutation happening. So you can imagine like every possible mutation is being made. And then it's such a strong selective pressure to be able to avoid the T cells that they get selected in each case. If we, this is showing you the area that encodes for an 11 amino acid long sequence. If I showed you every monkey that we ever infected that was MAMU A1 positive and we sequenced the entire 10,000 base pairs, they would not all be identical. But they would all have this change that had been selected for. All right. Um, and so you can see that this has a big role in disease progression. You could also imagine that if we had a situation, this is not how things were set up, but if we had a situation where our monkeys could transmit H our SIV to one another, and we had some monkeys that were MAMU A1 positive, if a monkey transmitted this virus, it would actually, to another monkey who has MAMU A1, that monkey would be in way worse shape than the one who got the original 
it would never ever make a CD8 response. It would be in really bad shape. And so this type of thing is a reason why sometimes people who have like different MHC types but who get the same infection will sometimes end up with different responses. And this is one of the reasons why we see so much variation in response um, with sort of the same pathogen. One, it has to do with the differences in MHC and whether you are perhaps getting a pathogen that is adapted to your MHC type versus someone else, um, which in some of the rapidly evolving pathogens can actually be a big issue. Yep. Um, because you do this out of, um, the way that they, they were doing this was out of uh, sequences that came out of colonies that they had to make, so it was how many colonies they got each time. Um, so I've got a couple other um, small class one related things I want to mention to you, um, and then I'm going to end with something fun. Um, so one problem that we can sort of imagine is that this is all really nice when we have peptides that should be presented on class one that are in the um, cytoplasm. But you could imagine that there might be peptides in other parts of the cell that you kind of would love to put on class one. Um, one of them is that there are proteins that actually are ER proteins that live in the ER membrane. And there's not a great way to degrade those. And so um, ER resident proteins do get uh, presented on class one um, because there is actually a, a um, channel that pulls them back out um, to send them to the proteasome. And so if a protein is an ER resident um, protein, it will go, uh, it will leave the ER to be degraded um, and will be degraded in the proteasome and then get presented on MHC class one. And so ER resident proteins will make it onto class one. So then I get to tell you about the other thing that confuses the heck out of everyone. So I talked about the fact that the whole point of MHC, presenting a peptide, is to turn on a T cell. And I mentioned to you last time that the MHC plus peptide has pretty low affinity for the T cell receptor. I told you that there were some other partner proteins that were involved in stabilizing the interaction. It turns out if you really want to activate a T cell really, really well, you need a few more proteins besides MHC and CD4 or CD8. Right now, you do not care what those proteins are called. Just know that there's a whole bunch of them. You will care later. And dendritic cells, DCs, are the best cells at activating T cells. And the reason for that is because they have a lot of those other proteins on their surface. So they are able to activate T cells super well because they have lots of other stuff in addition to MHC class, MHC class one or class two on their surface. So they have everything to turn on T cells super well. That's awesome. Yay, dendritic cells. But let's imagine that we have a pathogen that doesn't infect dendritic cells. For some reason, every immunologist I know, when they do this example, they use hepatitis virus. It's always the thing that infects the liver and not dendritic cells. Um, it's to the point where when my sister was taking one of her um, immunology classes, she called me and she's like, there's this question and it's something about hepatitis. And, and I'm like, oh, class one. It's the, it's the class one. I know exactly which question they're getting because everyone always goes with something that infects the liver here. Um, so if we have something that infects the liver, <laughs> that means it doesn't infect dendritic cells. And dendritic cells are the best at turning on T cells. So that kind of sucks because now we only can get meh T cells. We can't get really good T cells because our antigen is never in the cytoplasm of a dendritic cell. So, because class two will then get you onto CD4 cells and maybe you want a CD8 response. So like, you're, so there's this whole like, oh no, what happens? It turns out there's this process that's known as cross-presentation, 
where sometimes peptides that are in the biosynthetic secretory pathway, pa peptides that have been phagocytosed, can be released into the cytoplasm and can get presented on class one. Um, usually this is done by a dendritic cell or a macrophage that is phagocytosing a dead cell. So maybe we have a dead liver cell that has this liver virus. It gets phagocytosed and magically the epitopes leave the lysosome, make it into the cytoplasm and can go on class one. This process is known as cross presentation and how the epitopes escape the, end, the, phago, the uh, biosynthetic secretory pathway is not clear. There are multiple competing hypotheses. And so I told you before it is magically. And if you remember that it is magically, that is fine. Um, so there are ways that sometimes an antigen can escape um, this process and end up on class one. I'm telling you this because it seems to be really important in modern immunology and there are lots of different processes where we think this is super important. However, if you're looking at exam questions or things, I am generally not going to try to be going for cross presentation. Don't like go there with like as your immediate thought. I'm usually going with like the classical straightforward stuff. But when you are reading things about actual immune responses and sort of novel uh, descriptions of things, cross presentation is often in play. Um, it's seen in a lot of systems.